10,000 years ago, the ice withdrew from Ireland, leaving behind an empty, silent world. Then came footsteps, small groups crossing land bridges from the north, carrying stone tools and fire. Millennia later, archaeologists would find their traces, charred hazelnuts, bones, fragments of hearths beneath layers of peat. For centuries, people believed Ireland was shaped by invaders, Celts, Norse, Normans, each wave replacing the last. But the soil tells another story, one of quiet persistence rather than conquest. What if the Irish were never truly replaced at all? What if the island's oldest ancestors are still here, written not in legend, but in DNA? For centuries, the image of the Irish people has been wrapped in legend. A single tribe born from mist and myth. The first Irish, said to descend from Celtic warriors who arrived long ago. But beneath this enduring story lies another, written not in song or scripture, but in soil and bone. At Mount Sandal, the oldest known settlement in Ireland, archaeologists uncovered traces of a camp older than any Celtic record. Stone tools, burnt hazelnuts, and hearths dating back more than 10,000 years. This was the end of the Ice Age, when glaciers had only just retreated, and the land was still raw and new. The people who lived here hunted red deer and fished the cold estuaries. They were pioneers of a thawing world. Yet DNA analysis from remains found elsewhere in Europe reveals something striking. These early inhabitants were not ancestors of modern Irish populations. Their genetic signatures belong to a lineage that later vanished, replaced, absorbed, or extinguished by waves of newcomers. The myth of a single origin begins to unravel here. Ireland's earliest story is not one of permanence, but of succession. Layers of people arriving, thriving, and disappearing. The ice melts, and with it, the first Irish fade from history. But across the narrow sea, another people are already on the move, drawn to this untouched island at the edge of the world. Around 8,000 BC, as the last ice sheets withdrew, a narrow sea separated Ireland from Britain. Across that channel came small groups of hunters and fishers, descendants of mainland Europeans who followed herds and coastlines into a land reborn. They carried flint blades, antler picks, and woven nets, living lightly along rivers and forest edges. Archaeologists find traces of their lives along the Ban River, fragments of hearths and sharpened tools buried beneath layers of silt. Here, fires once burned beneath birch and pine. The air would have smelled of resin and smoke, a brief human presence in a vast, silent landscape but their story ends quietly. No clear descendants appear in Ireland's modern genome. Their genetic line fades, replaced by others who would come centuries later. Climate instability, resource scarcity, or simple isolation may have erased them. What remains are stones, not names. A culture remembered only by what it left behind. Then, a few thousand years later, Something remarkable appears in the archaeological record. Farmers, not foragers, arrive on Irish shores, bringing seeds, livestock, and an entirely new way of life. Around 4000 BC, the rhythms of Irish life changed completely. The Mesolithic hunter-gatherers vanished from the landscape, replaced by settlers who came not to wander, but to stay. They arrived by boat, likely from the Iberian Peninsula, carrying wheat, barley, and domesticated animals, the full toolkit of the Neolithic world. These newcomers cleared forests, built permanent dwellings, and raised monumental tombs that still dominate the countryside. At Newgrange, a single shaft of winter sunlight still pierces the chamber at dawn, aligning perfectly with carved spirals in stone. It is not random design, but engineering, a calendar of light and death, 
genetic evidence confirms their distinctness. Unlike the darker-haired hunter-gatherers before them, these early farmers had olive-toned skin, brown eyes, and ancestry linked to Mediterranean populations. Within centuries, their genes replaced nearly all that came before. Ireland's first lasting population emerged here, a blend of southern roots and northern adaptation. Their world thrived for nearly 2,000 years. But eventually the pattern shifted again. From across the sea, a new force of innovation and new bloodlines arrived, bearing not stone or pottery, but metal. By 2500 BC, the age of stone gave way to the shimmer of metal. In the southwest, along the hills of Kerry and Cork, early miners dug into seams of copper, mixing it with imported tin to create bronze. These alloys reshaped daily life. New axes, ornaments, and weapons circulating through trade routes that reached as far as Iberia and the Eastern Mediterranean. But beneath this economic shift lay another transformation, genetic. DNA from Bronze Age burials reveals a new ancestry entering Ireland, people carrying steppe genes from far to the east, related to the Yamnaya herders who once roamed the plains of Eurasia. Their arrival brought not destruction, but merging, an integration that would define the island's next era. These newcomers likely introduced early forms of Indo-European language, laying the foundations for what would become the Irish tongue. Within a few generations, their genetic markers dominated much of the population, blending with Neolithic roots to form a hybrid identity. Language, lineage, and craft intertwined. Yet even as Europe grew connected through trade and empire, Ireland remained apart, an island developing its own quiet continuity beyond the reach of kings and legions. For generations, history books described Ireland as the product of great Celtic invasions. Waves of warriors sweeping westward from Central Europe, conquering the island and imprinting their culture. Yet, no such event appears in the soil. Archaeologists find no mass graves, no burned settlements, no interruption in local craftsmanship. The transition to Celtic Ireland seems to have occurred without conquest. Instead, the evidence points to gradual diffusion. Art styles such as Hallstatt and Latin, the swirling patterns carved into bronze and stone, arrived through trade, not invasion. The people of Ireland likely adopted these symbols, and with them, elements of Celtic language and identity. Modern genetics supports this quieter story. DNA from Iron Age burials shows deep continuity with earlier Bronze Age populations. There was no replacement, only evolution. The Celts, it seems, were never a people who arrived, but a culture that spread, reshaped, reinterpreted, and localized on every shore it touched. And as Celtic identity matured on the island, another power began to rise beyond the horizon, an empire whose reach would stop just short of Ireland's shores. By the first century AD, Roman legions had conquered much of Western Europe. Roads and forts spread from Spain to the northern frontier of Britain. Yet Ireland remained untouched, the one major island Rome never claimed. To Roman geographers, it was Hibernia, remote, misted, and sparsely known. Still, the two worlds were not isolated. Along Ireland's eastern coast, archaeologists find Roman coins, glassware, and fragments of amphorae, the quiet footprints of trade. Irish chieftains may have exchanged cattle and hides for wine, olive oil, and prestige goods. Some even served as mercenaries in Britain, returning home with stories of empire and silver pay. Ireland's independence preserved its genetic continuity. No large-scale colonization altered its demographic line. Instead, the island evolved as a parallel world, aware of Rome, yet defined by its absence. The empire would collapse in time, but Ireland's isolation turned into its advantage. In the centuries that followed, this land beyond the frontier would send something Rome never expected. Not armies, but scribes and memory. After Rome's decline, Ireland entered a quiet golden age. 
Isolated from continental wars, it became a refuge of learning. Monasteries at Clonmacnoise, Kells, and Glendalo rose from river valleys and stone hills. Centers of literacy where monks copied not only scripture, but history, myth, and lineage. These scholars preserved fragments of an older world. Within illuminated pages, ancient oral traditions merged with Christian cosmology. Tales of the Milesians, Tuatha de Danann, and Fir Bolg, mythic tribes said to have settled Ireland, echo the real prehistoric migrations that archaeology and genetics now uncover. The monks could not have known it, but their stories carried faint memories of Neolithic farmers and Bronze Age wanderers. Through parchment and ink, identity survived. The Irish exported this intellectual wealth back to a fractured Europe, reintroducing classical learning to lands that had forgotten it. Yet, centuries later, those same texts would be reinterpreted, reshaped by foreign rulers who sought to define what Irish meant in their own image. When the Anglo-Normans landed in Ireland in the 12th century, they encountered a people whose lineage reached back millennia. Yet colonial narratives quickly rewrote that ancestry. English chroniclers described the Irish as barbarous and ancient remnants, a people outside civilization. Centuries of occupation recast Irish origins not as continuity, but as deficiency. Genealogies once meant to preserve heritage were turned against their creators. Myths of descent from the Milesians, or Sons of Gael, became tools of classification and control. The deep prehistoric story of farmers, traders, and slow cultural diffusion was replaced by racialized hierarchies. And yet, even within empire, fragments of the older story persisted. Local scholars recorded oral histories, preserving place names and ancestral ties. Beneath the imposed narratives, the genetic and archaeological record remained unchanged. A quiet proof that Ireland's people had never been erased. Only reinterpreted by the 19th century, new sciences would finally begin to measure what myth and empire had long obscured, the true biological continuity of the Irish people. In the early 21st century, Irish origins were no longer a matter of legend or politics, but of data. Ancient DNA recovered from burials across the island, from Neolithic tombs to Iron Age graves, allowed scientists to reconstruct 10,000 years of ancestry. The findings were precise and quiet in their revelation. About 90% of modern Irish genetic makeup descends from two major prehistoric groups, early Neolithic farmers from the Near East and later Bronze Age herders from the Eurasian steppe. But these arrivals did not erase one another. Instead, they blended, gradually forming a population that remained remarkably stable for nearly four millennia. Modern Irish genomes still mirror that mixture almost exactly. Even regional patterns, west versus east, coastal versus inland, reflect ancient settlement roots. The story of Ireland is thus not one of invasion, but of endurance. And as the data came into focus, it reframed what Irish truly meant. Not a single origin, but a tapestry of continuity, memory, and quiet survival. In the green silence of Ireland's valleys, identity was never just blood. It was memory, layered over time. From megalithic tombs to illuminated manuscripts, from Bronze Age carvings to modern DNA maps, the island's story forms a continuous thread of adaptation rather than rupture. Each generation reinterpreted the one before it, adding belief, language, and ritual without erasing what lay beneath. Even today, traces of the earliest settlers remain visible in folklore and place names. Genetic data now confirms what oral tradition long implied, that the people who call Ireland home share deep roots with those who first cleared its forests after the Ice Age. The myths, once dismissed as fantasy, now echo faintly as metaphorical truths. In the end, Irish origins are not about a single beginning, but the endurance of connection, 
between land and lineage, between memory and meaning. The island's story did not start with conquest or empire, and it does not end with science. It continues quietly, in DNA and in story, both whispering the same truth. They were always here.